I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's uh, panel discussion called Women for Peace on the Horn of Africa. I thank you very much for coming this long way to this location on a very beautiful summer day and despite all the corona restrictions. My name is Franz Miguel and I'm the, in charge of the Africa Policy Desk at the VIDC. This event is also part of a small but very important networking conference, Women for Peace, and I welcome all the participants here in the room, but also who are sitting at home in front of their screens. We are very sorry that a part of the conference participants are not today with us. You came to Vienna. Thank you very much for joining us. There is a fourth speaker, Rachel Ebrecht. She couldn't come to Vienna because of the flight ban from UK, like many other speakers we have invited, but she will join us online later on. All speakers will be, more, will be introduced later on properly by our moderator, Rita Isiba. I would like to thank our long-time partner, the Austrian Development Corporation, for their financial support. I thank also Ahu Studio for technical assistance and my colleagues from the VIDC who did a great job the last days to organize this hybrid, hybrid conference. And I especially would thank also to Dr. Ishraga Hamid, who is the initiator of this new and inspiring network, Women for Peace. Thank you. The VADC feels very honored, and we are very happy to host this uh, founding assembly of the network. There are many reasons. I just want to mention two. First, the UN Security Council Resolution 1323 25 on women, peace, and security is a focal area of our work. And second, the engagement of the African diaspora in Europe is incredible, incredible and important, especially we have seen it during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the other side is this work remains mostly invisible and unpaid and this must be changed. We want to contribute to this. The panel discussion is also part of a very new campaign in Austria called the right to stay, European policy and the causes of flight. While many European decision makers see the root causes of conflict, of forced migration and other uh, difficulties, challenges, in the countries of the Global South itself, this campaign refers to the global dimension. The legacy of colonialism to racism, to the unfair trade relation, and to the illicit financial flows out of, Aust out of uh, Africa. It's around 60 to 80 billion dollars a year, more than the so-called development aid. And it refers to the global inequality and the impact of the impact of the climate change or climate catastrophe, like people in the South call it, and they are right to call it. There is the question who causes and who suffers. And this is really unequal. The info more information you will find in this brand new folder, but also on the website and social media tools of the Austrian Chamber of Labor and the Trade Union. They are the two main initiators of this campaign. So the basic issue is we have to change things in Europe. The changes in the Global South will be enabled. But uh, just to come to an end, of my introduction, the uh, technical information. 
The COVID-19 pandemic, as you know, is not yet over. We have some people in this room who are not vaccinated. Therefore, I would say, please keep your mask. Only if you speak, you can remove it. And second uh, aspect, uh, it's quite hot today. After this event, there will be a drink offered, but please keep distance according to the rules we have now. It will be recorded, not only a live stream, but also recorded, and we will make a documentation, and therefore also photos will be made. At the end, please give us your feedback. you find some questions on your chair, and you can also use an electronic version. There is a QR code on this questionnaire. But now it's time to hand over to Dr. Ishraga Hamid. She is a writer, a translator, a human rights and women activist. She is a feminist. But most of all, this is important for today, she is the initiator of the Women for Peace Network. Thank you an inspiring evening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. First of all, I would like to thank Vienna Institute for International Dialogue and Cooperation for making this conference possible. Building a network for peace and security with an activist researchers and art artist women from Horn of, of Africa and Europe wa was an old dream. And we attempted several times. First, firstly, in Rome, as I attended the conference of the network of Eritrean women, and I brought as a honorary member an idea to build, to build a network for women of Horn of Africa. And three years ago, we, some activist women from Horn of Africa in Vienna, tried again to continue building it, but it wasn't moving on. The idea raised again during the struggle of the COVID-19. So I started to create a feminist platform called Arts of Banat Mandi to continue working on issues. In March 2021, I organized virtual international conference on Sudanese women, gender and diversity under the slogan Mandi Shines from Vienna with Global Visions. Um, a number of African women and human rights activists in Europe, Canada, and Horn of Africa participated in a session entitled, entitled Peace and Security in the Horn of Africa from Gender Perspectives that was at the Ferris Conference of Panat Mendi. Mendi bin the Sultan Agabna was an anti-colonial fighter. 1908 in Nuba Mountains in Sudan. I was 10 years old when I heard about her from our neighbor, who was born also in Nuba Mountain. He was the best storyteller I have ever met. Mandy played an important role for the liberation of the Sudan. Unfortunately, unfortunately we never thought about her at the school, although other great female fighters have been a little bit mentioned in our history. Therefore, I want to contribute to highlight her role and to make her visible as role models for all invisible female fighters in Sudan as well in in Horn of, Af of Africa. One of the es essential uh, and passionate aim of Panat Mandi building networks. This network should be based on the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 to empower women as the peace builders and peace promoters. One of the important goals to, to strengthen the role of the women and gender awareness in the promotion of peace and security in Horn of Africa and to have 
a significant impact on politics and decision making. I strongly believe in our willing as well as our experiences and competences in capacity building. We women of Horn of Africa, we are different. We have different background and perspectives, but we have common and similar visions to promote peace and to build strategies for peace network to, Im to implement its agenda. Furthermore, empowerment, advocacy, and lobby works to achieve our goals. I wish, I wish you an amazing and blooming, fruitful conference. Thank you for your attention. Okay, well, good evening and a very warm welcome to Women for Peace in the Horn of Africa. My name is Rita Isiba and I'm delighted to be your moderator for this evening. I'd also like to welcome our peers from across the world who are joining us from Facebook and of course our esteemed activists and academics who will share their perspectives on how, the Afri how women in the African diaspora can help advance peace and uh, also try and mitigate the conflict in the Horn of Africa. We'll start off with a series of short presentations and uh, following these presentations, we'll have a panel discussion. And the aim of this panel discussion is to investigate in what we can yeah, do. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? women in Africa, but also how we here in Austria, or perhaps in other parts of the world, can help facilitate women with the equipment, with the knowledge, or perhaps with the resources to mitigate the conflicts that they endure. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests. Our first guest that I'd like to welcome is Iman Safedin, who is the initiator of the Solidan Campaign for Democratic Transfer in Sudan. Please put your hands together for Iman. <laughs> Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Az Azia Abdul Kadir, who is the chairwoman of the Network of Eastern Women, and she coordinates Austria's Kingdom Hotel in Somalia. Please put your hands together for Azia. Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Mariam Vazaitmala, who is an architect specializing in urban planning and also in gender issues. Please put your hands together for Dr. Vazaitmala. And with us today from Goldsmith University in London, remotely, I'd like to welcome Rachel Ibret, who is a brilliant researcher who focuses on human rights, justice, and civil society. Rachel, welcome. So, I would like to start off now with Iman. Before you share with us your ideas in how to... Um, Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. I'm very pleased and honored to be here. And I would like to say thank you to the Latin.
This um, this uh, fragments not not yielding the the map that we are seeing in in atlases and in books, but also it affects the human beings in in a way in a way or another. Uh, that is to say, the, the the disintegration or colonialism comes with uh, with the issues of new languages that sets in Africa, and new borders that we uh, that splitted. Uh, the long-standing kingdoms of Africa. For example, that uh, one of the kingdoms that have been split into two, the Zagawa kingdom that have been split, part of it is in Chad and part of it in Sudan, where part of it is French and part of it is English. Uh, the same as the, the Wadai kingdom that, that remains, uh, therefore actually part of it, the Wadai kingdom remains in the French side and therefore become in the British colonialism in Sudan. This is, uh, this is how, uh, this how it started. And as uh, Alex Dual mentioned that Darfur is a unique situation with, um, it's a region that have never been well integrated in the, in the, in the new Sudan uh, due to uh, several barriers of language and, and, and the, the way of, uh, of ruling system in the region, it's really different. And up to date, we have a problem of incorporating the, the, the new ruling system in Darfur. Uh, nevertheless, post the colonial, uh, the colonial era, we have, uh, uh, we have, uh, Sudan have been ruled by dictatorship. Uh, and the dictators have been, have been supported, uh, have been supported by after the, the war, the, the World War II, uh, some uh, dictators have been uh, getting support from other countries and their proxies uh, provided them with money, weapons and whatsoever. And this era has been characterized by uh, easy access to weapons and there is lots of rebel groups that rebelled against the dictators uh, and for example, in Sudan, we have the Anyanya movement that have started long time ago and carried out a 50 years civil war in Sudan. And this is one of the, the reasons that has exhausted the country. Uh, the Horn of Africa has a significant geostrategic importance, uh, not only because of the, uh, the Suez Canal that have linked uh, the, the, east, uh, the eastern part of the world to the western part of the world, but it is also, uh, there is now heterogeneous intervention of the pillars, like we are having the European pillars in, like in Turkish and the Middle East Bureau, the African Bureau, so many bureaus are interacting within this region with different interests. And it has been challenging that the different pillars to come uh, together to a united policy or a, um, uh, or a, although they have they have the same uh, same ambitions to reach long standing peace in the in the in the region and to combat terrorism but still this effort have never fruits in a, in a tangible uh, tangible um, uh, results and here where i think the people the african people should intervene and help the international community of approaching the everlasting peace in the region. We have uh, the, the, the Horn of Africa is also characterized by uh, the military presence, uh, huge military presence in the Horn of Africa in, um, uh, it's, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Red Sea, across the Red Sea and Bab al uh, Strait. Uh, the presence of everybody is there, all the world is there with different missions and different, uh, different capacities. But still, the, still the, the, 
the, the, the issues of combating terrorism is not well achieved and the, the, the Horn of Africa remains very fragile. Uh, in the two past years with two, uh, two peace uh, missions, United Nations missions in Somalia and in Darfur, and uh, a lot of uh, refugees that resulted in all uh, the Horn of Africa, mainly in Sudan and in Kenya and, uh, and in neighboring countries. When I, when I would like to, uh, to correlate the issues of Horn of Africa uh, together, I cannot do this only when I correlate climate change, migration, and conflict, because these three, uh, three driving forces are acting and affecting each other in a way, uh, each other vigorously. Uh, for example, because of the drought of the Lake of Chad, we have a, a huge number of people that have migrated to you due to the uh, climatic changes that happen in sub-Saharan Africa towards Sudan. And at the same time, we have the droughts that, that, that force millions of people to, to migrate from Eritrea and Ethiopia and come to Sudan, while Sudan itself is a fragile country that cannot sustain this huge number of migrants or refugees to stay and to build a new life in the country. This is the situation that led millions of people to flee and to be migrants or seeking a refuge somewhere else where they can find a good, uh, a good uh, living conditions. The second issue is the conflict. Conflict in, in the Horn of Africa are too many and can be, uh, can be examined in different, uh, in different uh, manners or different perspectives from the political economy, state formation, and uh, processes, uh, identity conflict, environmental changes, and so forth. But mainly, we, uh, we classify the conflicts in interstate uh, prolonged uh, chronic conflicts, like what, is go what had been happening in South Sudan until the cessation for s more than 55 years. And in Darfur, it's now a very prolonged conflict. And then again, when, where we can see in, in Somalia and, and many other points of, the, uh, of the, the region. We have also interstate conflicts that we are now very much affected by, of what is happening between uh, Ethiopia and Sudan uh, along the borders. This is a very alarming issue and, and, and this will put the region in a very... Uh, uh, very specific conditions of having more atrocities and more human rights abuses. We have already uh, as uh, interstate uh, conflict in Tigray, and I think my colleague is going to uh, to speak about that much more and elaborate on this issue. That's why I would like to skip it. But uh, this is um, 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 uh, this is. What we can explain here is that the horn is, uh, um, is, is having a chronic, uh, chronic, prolonged human rights abuses during these conflicts. Because in the same, in Darfur, uh, rape has been used as a tool of war, and the same thing has been used also in the Tigray and so many uh, other areas that could be also uh, not very much examined. Uh, for the climate change, uh, there is uh, there is lots of lots of issues uh, regarding the climate change, uh, from desertification and drought and famine and so many so many issues that correlated to uh, to uh, climate change. But I would like here tonight to st to stick on food security is one of the alarming issues that puts the Horn of Africa under hunger. Million, millions of people are needed to support against hunger and famine. And, 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 and the recurrent uh, health conditions, and this is also one of the reasons that drives millions of people to flee their, uh, their natural uh, uh, places or villages or communities and try to seek another, uh, another refuge where they can feed, them, feed themselves. Uh, why I choose the food security? Because the report, there is a report just come out uh, last month, the month of May. It's uh, the report that comes from the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, and WFP, 
which describes that uh, the coming year, uh, this year, we are having a huge, the, the, the hunger will hit 20 countries in, uh, um, around the globe, but 10 of them are countries around the, the Horn of Africa and Yemen. And most of these countries have also been, uh, been affected by, uh, by floods. Where now floods one of the uh, one of the phenomena of climate change that uh, that's also not only we are having droughts but we are having also surplus of wa water that cannot be well managed by by governments and uh, and I think the catastrophe of the hunger we are still having in our minds the hunger that hits the the, the, the region in 1983 1984 where we have lost millions of people and especially children and women who could never flood their villages to find food and, and water resources. Uh, the mainstream, and this is where I, uh, I always um, uh, advocate that uh, all the European governments, the EU and the, uh, and the United States and all uh, the partners that talks to my government, that they should relate their talks and their shares and their donations with the issues on and, and limitations of climatic change because we don't have clear uh, clear strategy to mitigate the measures of climate change until now and i think now we need to revise all the policies and all the programs that is running in the country to be compatible with the climatic change because it is a global issue. It's not the issue of Sudan only. It affects the, uh, all over the globe. Uh, I, would like, I would like now to speak about Sudan as a case of political change. And uh, this is like a half a minute video where you can, uh, maybe you can play there. Okay, the video might not be working now. Can you just tell us briefly about the video? Yeah, um, uh, it's actually the video is just showing you the pictures of how many women have participated in democracy, uh, uh, in, in, uh, mm -hmm. in demonstrations mm -hmm. all over Sudan, different regions, different cities. And I would like to emphasize how the same women who have sacrificed their life and went out on the street they are not represented in power. Uh, uh, it is sad that this, uh, this thing cannot be shown. Since the video cannot be shown, yeah. can you perhaps tell us where we can perhaps see it? Is it available on YouTube or on I, website? Uh, no, it's a special video that has been designed. Oh, I see. Event. It is half a minute video. It's, uh, it's something small. It's just to... Okay, so let's skip it. Okay, then uh, in Sudan, the revolution has started uh, in, uh, on um, 18th December 2019, and people have demonstrated all over the, 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 the country. Uh, we have lost almost 3,000 martyrs, and we are still on the count because we are still having or discovering that there is some uh, dead bodies that are in, uh, in sanctuaries. Uh, we have, um, we have besides those who have been, uh, who are not found, the lost people. We don't also have a good uh, or precise estimates of how many people that have never returned back to their homes. We have women who have been raped during the massacre, during the sitting, or during the massacre of the 3rd of June. We have, uh, uh, in the revolution, different uh, civil society organizations have participated voluntarily in the, in, the, in the revolution or in the protest and a constitutional charter at the end of negotiation between the Transitional Military Council and the, free, the force of freedom and change has been signed and concluded. The Sudanese Professional Association has uh, orchestrated the demonstrations and uh, uh, it was a great role from this group of young uh, women and men to, uh, to do a tremendous work of having all these mass people organized and coming out on the streets and showed in different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, places and cities. 
Um, myself, I am one of the people who I initiated the, the Sudanese Environmentalist Association. It's uh, one of the associations that uh, within, the, within the quorum of the Sudanese Professional Association. Um, thanks to the media and networking that it makes it easy for us to communicate and to, uh, and to have our meetings done and to have our, our revolutionary work started. It was easy for us and for me as somebody who's outside the country to speak and, uh, and, to, and to make uh, statements and everything while it has been a little bit not okay for my colleagues inside to do, to do the same job. Uh, it's now changing, but uh, that was the situation during that time. Then a hybrid government led by the Transitional Military Council uh, in, uh, that, that stated due, uh, according to the Constitutional Charter that will lead the government on the first half and on the second half should be the civil partners. But still now, and this, the D date should be, uh, the D date was on the 27th of May, but still now we are not sure what is going to happen to this uh, transition to the, to the civil groups. Uh, the, 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 the constitutional charter has been infringed several times uh, and not completely followed. This is, uh, it has been so painful for us to, to, to see this, but uh, it is a changing process. We also believe that it cannot be a textbook change, and we have been so patient to, to, have, to have something, something tangible on our hands. But unfortunately, the transition up to now uh, is not happening. Uh, so, Iman, I would like to ask you to conclude, um, because uh, we need to make sure that everyone gets to have a say as well in the impulse. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then I'm going to speak on the representation of women. According to the statistics we have, uh, women constitute 65% of the demonstrators on the street. On the Sudanese Professional Association Quorum is 21 members, four of them are women. The negotiation between Transitional Military Council and uh, the Force of Freedom and Chain, uh, the, there were uh, 23 members. Only one of them uh, is a woman. The Force of Freedom and Chain executive body is 23 members. Three of them are women. Supreme Council is 14. Two of them is women and one is already resigned the position. The executive is 20 ministers, four of them uh, is ministers. Council of Governing Partners, 29 uh, representatives, only one is women. The, 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 the armed uh, rebel groups, 0% uh, representation of women until now. It's very painful for us that we participate genuinely in the revolution and then the outcome is not, uh, is not ours. This is one of the, uh, one of the um, uh, constraints for the trans transition to democratic state. The other, uh, the other thing is that uh, we have, because of this uh, convention that have been concluded, we have the rapid support force have been forwarded to the Supreme Council which I believe it's, a, it's the militia that has been formed by the former regime and uh, committed atrocities in Darfur uh, during the genocide. These militia have been uh, assigned uh, to, uh, for, border, for border control during Bashir regime. And because of the Khartoum process that has been initiated in the European Union, all the funds that have been forwarded to the, to the Bashir government have been donated easily to the militia of rapid support forces, and still now they are making benefit of this. Uh, and not only this, uh, there is another, uh, the policies that the European Union have made to, to render refugees from reaching Europe uh, has been adversely affect the human rights situation in Sudan and in the neighboring countries because because of this because of these uh, policies we have been seeing slavery came back 
In Libya, people, the African migrants have been sold as slaves and uh, the detention centers have been bombarded in Tajura and uh, um, huge and severe human rights violations for migrant women have occurred in detention centers, especially in Eastern Sudan, where the refugees, the women come from Eritrea and Ethiopia. All these have been, uh, these crimes have been committed by people who are responsible for border control, which is the rapid support force. Uh, I will stop here because I don't want to, to come into the, the, the time of my colleagues, but I, will come, uh, I welcome any, any questions that may arise during the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Iman. Thank you very much for explaining us the correlation between conflict, uh, climate change, and migration. You certainly help us understand. Uh, I would like to um, welcome Asia's perspectives as well. Um, forgive me, Asia's perspective. Uh, you will help us understand Ethiopia's Tigray crisis and the importance of strengthening female peace activists. What message would you like to convey to your audience? Good evening. Thank you for um, the invitation tonight. Um, just a correction. I um, am no longer the chairwoman of uh, the Network of Eritrean Women. We had recently um, an election, so someone uh, beautiful uh, and uh, strong people have taken over the position. So I'm here as an active or founding member of the Network of Eritrean Women. And I work for the Kinder Nordhöfe. Germany in Somaliland, just as a um, correction for my interpret, um, my presentation. No, sir, thank you. Um, I think um, the issue when I um, as it, it was uh, it came also in um, Iman's uh, presentation. We witness um, every time that this, the same perpetrator of uh, conflict and the mess that we are in are the same people that uh, sit. Uh, in peace negotiation uh, or at the peace negotiation table and the people that have become uh, victim massively have no voice and this, uh, this is a vicious circle this has been repeatedly in history and we are compliant somehow in a way we are part of this um, history because nothing changed especially the Horn of Africa has become you know a, a conflict um, area and um, and this is uh, why I think um, now um, women and children who are um, victim of uh, these co conflicts in Horn of Africa and elsewhere have to um, gain uh, voice. Thanks for sharing. Please, the floor is yours. Um, well, I think um, I'm not going to go into detail um, about Ethiopia because I guess we have an Ethiopian colleague um, who was supposed to speak. For me, I'm just taking a little bit um, the example of the Tigray um, conflict um, to show how um, um, important it is to um, involve civil society in peace negotiation. So I'll briefly, um, I'll briefly speak about the Tigray. I'll briefly speak about the Tigray crisis and why it is important for the international community and for all of us um, to strengthen uh, civil society and women-led initiatives to en enable um, um, sustainable peace. After more than twenty years um, of no peace, no war situation between Eritrea and Ethiopia. In September 2018, the two leaders of uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia signed a formal treaty in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. The rapprochement uh, and uh, the peace agreement between Eritrea and Ethiopia raised a lot of expectation, both regionally and internationally. For a while, all went well. Ethiopians and Eritreans visited each other country for a joyful, tearful reunion with their families. Imagine two neighboring countries with really mixed marriages, mixed families, were not able to see each other for more than 20 years. So for the first time, Eritreans were able to travel into Ethiopia easily and thousands made their journey up to 500, years, uh, up to 500 people a day leaving Eritrea for a better life. So um, 
One year later, however, the situation was reversed and the borders were, fine, were officially closed. Um, no explanation was given, but it was obvious that Eritrean authorities feared opposition groups based in Ethiopia might cross the border. While the two leaders celebrated their popularity and achievements, Eritrea and Ethiopia drifted into deeper crisis. The regime in Asmara, uh, for example, targeted religious groups, cracking down on a, a Muslim school in Asmara. It has disrupted Christian prayers meetings, arrested members of uh, churches, and even detained outspoken uh, priests and monks from the Orthodox Church for supporting the patriarch of the Orthodox Church, who has been under house arrest since 2005. The government closed 33 hospitals, clinics, health facilities run, run by the Catholic Church because the Catholic, one of the Catholic Church priests was um, outspoken and he demanded peace. In Ethiopia, the tension between Tigray and Abiy's administration grew by the day. Around that time, uh, more than 2 million Ethiopians were displaced by ethnic conflict and there was unexplained coup uh, attempt in the Amhara region with um, the killing of uh, the army chief of staff in Addis Ababa. There was a series of similar incidents leading up to the Tigray crisis that erupted early November 2020 uh, when Abiy Ahmed ordered a military offensive against Tigray. Meanwhile, at least two, people, uh, two million people have been displaced by the conflict and more than 60,000 people have crossed the border to Sudan. And this is, again, history, history repeats itself. Uh, the UN says that about um, around 4.5 million people in the region will require aid urgently in the next few months and years to come. Since the beginning of the, uh, of the war, there has been multiple reports that Ethiopian and Eritrean troops are committing unspeakable atrocities, indiscriminate killing of civilians and raping thousands of women. This war is the best proof that wars and armed conflicts have gendered aspect where women are, and children in, to some extent are used as a, a weapon of war. Today, the peace agreement appears insignificant. Abiy has never announced neither, um, neither uh, announced to neither Ethiopia's parliament nor to the Ethiopian public the terms of the peace deal. And the Eritrean parliament, which was disbanded in February 20, 2002, has not reassembled and has not, has not had any opportunity to scrutinize uh, uh, or ratify the peace agreement between Eritrea and, and Ethiopia or between Isaiah Saforki and Abiy Ahmed. The Tigray crisis is receiving a huge international attention. International actors are include uh, international actors, including the U.S., are demanding for unrestricted access to Tigray to deliver aid, to trap civilians, and to allow independent investigation to take place. Um, so in 2002, the UN Security Council acknowledged through the creation of re the Resolution 1325 the change nature of fighting in which civilians are increasingly targeted and women continue to be excluded from, particip from participation in peace processes. The peace process uh, between Eritrea and Ethiopia failed to adequately consult local stakeholders, including T the TPLF, the Tigrayan um, basically movement or um, part. Uh, we have again and again uh, we have seen again and again uh, that peace deal is likely not to last without uh, the buy-in from all le relevant stakeholders, uh, including women-led initiatives. It is um, undeniable that um, the 1325 represents a milestone in the fight for women's fundamental human rights. However, the level of its significant um, uh, significant significance uh, 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 of its significance uh, and considering it is it lacks enforcement measures has repeatedly been um, criticized by academics and practitioners alike as above mentioned uh, women are both uh, women are oft, often victims of conflict and insecurity it's really important that they are 
consulted before any peace building initiatives are carried out. I would say women in the region of Horn of Africa have a very strong focus on community um, rather than themselves as individuals, so they are able to bring crucial community perspectives to the table during the peace pro building process. When women in Sudan uh, went on the street, they were not asked, they just went because it is important. And, um, and when Eritrea um, uh, struggled, uh, Eritrea had um, a struggle with Ethiopia independent uh, fighting for 30 years. One third of the Eritrean army was um, uh, made well, outright of women and they were not asked. They, they, went, they went for, for this for the fighting because it was their national duty. And so it's very difficult actually to comprehend why is it so difficult when there is uh, there is um, a change and transformation completely these women that have sacrificed their life like the Sudanese women to go on the street to protest they are not part of this um, transformation this is very difficult for us to, to understand after um, 60 70 years of um, um, the Horn of Africa being a very uh, tense um, region so the international community needs to fully commit to promoting women's, um, women's meaningful participation. To date, there has been a lot of talk about supporting women with little concrete result, uh, result on the ground to show for it. Um, I think I'll stop um, here um, to, for us to have a fruitful discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Asia. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing us the background and the current state of the Tigray crisis. Uh, this brings me to Mariam. You will provide us with an insight on the conflict of power and resources in the Horn of Africa. What do you hope to achieve in your presentation? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, as I would say, I would like to thank uh, the Vienna International Institute for, cooperation, for dialogue and cooperation and uh, for organizing this meeting and uh, giving us an opportunity to reflect or to present our vision about uh, peace in uh, the Horn of Africa. I would like to talk about the root causes of the conflicts in the Horn of Africa and also I, I, I want to, to talk about where we need to intervene to achieve uh, a sustainable peace in our region. It is not uh, easy to achieve peace with uh, only amendments or some, some intervention not uh, talking about the root causes of the conflicts. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I also I want to thank uh, Benat Mendi, Arts of Benat Mendi and Victoria Shraga for uh, initiating this group of activists and uh, experts from Horn of Africa. Uh, my uh, my contribution entitled uh, Power and Wealth, uh, Conflicts in the Horn of Africa and their impact on uh, livelihoods, gender livelihoods and uh, uh, pattern of migration. Uh, at the beginning, I would like to emphasize that conflicts in the Horn of Africa are not new. Uh, yeah, they have been going on since ancient times, but in the modern era, they have been more complex. And that is due to intervention from international actors, uh, especially after uh, Suez, uh, opening of the Suez Canal and uh, discovering oil in uh, uh, Gulf states. Uh, at the first glance, this uh, conflict seems to be for ethnic or cultural uh, reason, but uh, 
a deep look reveals that this conflict is uh, or are um, over land and it is resources. Even these resources at the surface of the earth, uh, such as uh, farmland or pastures or, uh, uh, or water or uh, waterways, or inside the earth, such as oil or mineral, minerals or something like this. Uh, yeah, uh, for, to, to illustrate this, uh, this point, I will talk about the case of Sudan. And especially, I will talk about uh, agriculture in Sudan and how the intervention of uh, the colonialism changed the system of livelihoods and people living and uh, destroyed at the end, and how this uh, impacts our, uh, our communities and uh, the pattern of migration. Uh, the uh, before colonialism, our uh, our societies they have communal uh, 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 communal system of land ownership. In this system, the leaders of the groups of various groups they have the right to or the role to to distribute land between their members of groups and uh, resolve the conflicts. When the uh, uh, colonialism came, they uh, make uh, a lot of interventions in this system. Uh, first intervention was uh, uh, the uh, the first intervention was the registration of Sudan lands as a government property, and with exception of about two percent. Uh, Ninety-eight percent uh, registered as uh, a government uh, property, and uh, introduction of mechanized uh, farming, in addition to shift from subsistence uh, farming to crop uh, to to cash crop such as cotton to supply uh, textile factories. These three interventions defined a utilitarian development approach that seeks to maximize profits uh, of those with power as the expense of the needs of the communities. This is the first intervention. And unfortunately, our uh, successive uh, regimes, most of them or uh, for 50, uh, 50 or more than 50 years after independence, we have uh, Authoritarian regimes, and they continue the same the same approach. They expand uh, the mechanized agriculture uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, subsistence agriculture for communities. And because the land now is a government pro property, the government has the right to to exploit this land or to the, to relocate to relocate for other person or to utilize it. They have the, the right to, to make anything in, in this land and the communities have, the communities have uh, lost their right to the land. Uh, also, the second intervention is the cleaning of uh, weeds and forests from millions of acres to expand mechanized agriculture. This is in 60s and 70s of the last century which led to drought and desertification and subsequent famine in, 18, in 1983. Uh, the, the third uh, intervention from our authoritarian regimes uh, is continuous marginalization for local communities in the production areas from, yeah, for a long time. Most of these areas, they, they have no infrastructure, they have no educational and health services, and they have no also alternative uh, job opportunities. They lost their land, they lost their uh, uh, livelihoods, and they have no alternative uh, uh, job opportunities. Uh, 
to put it in a nutshell, this utilitarian approach to development, which introduced by colonialism and adopted by the successive regimes in, po in the post-independence period, led to the loss of livelihoods and the impoverishment of millions in favor of local and international investors, as well as destroying environment and these consequences led to outbreak of armed conflicts in different parts of our country. Please, uh, slide number six. Number six. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in these figures, we can see how the different interventions in different times affect the livelihoods of people and their pattern of migration. In uh, 1925, the, the colonial government, uh, uh, yeah, in, uh, made, this, uh, made this intervention for the system of land ownership and introduced the new a new approach to production. In the 40s, the people lost their land. They, some of them, they, they began to, to, to migrate to cities. This seasonal migration began in 1940 and continued. At that time, only young men migrate and their families uh, stay at uh, their original places. Uh, women, children, and, uh, and elderly. In the uh, 60s and 70s of the last century, when the government expanded the uh, mechanized uh, agriculture and uh, uh, most of the land uh, invested by, by government or uh, funded by the Wiley Bank, began the permanent uh, migration to cities because most of the people, they lost their, uh, their livelihoods. Then the young families, as we, sh we show here in this uh, figure, young fam families uh, migrate to cities and live permanently in cities. The third phase after the drought and desertification, and in this uh, phase, the entire family uh, migrate to cities, searching for, uh, for food and for jobs. And uh, number four, phase number four, when the uh, government marginalized these people after disasters and, do, uh, and did nothing for them, began the armed conflict. First in the South Sudan and then expanded to many parts of Sudan and in 2003 in uh, Darfur and then began another type of migration. Uh, elderly women and children. This is new because the, most of the young men involved in conflicts, then uh, women with their children and elderly, they have to go to cities or to other places searching for new uh, jobs. And most of these women were farmers because in our country, uh, in the 60s, uh, the uh, force work about 80% of the, of, the, of the people work in agriculture and women were uh, 84% and men 64%. So most of these women were farmers, then, uh, then they, they have to go to, to, or to flee to, to, to cities and search for new job. Most of them work in uh, informal work because most of them are not educated because their original, original places are marginalized and they have no chance to go to school. So they, they, when come to, to the cities, they have to work in informal work. And the uh, number five, phase number five, they, they have been marginalized also in cities. 
and this is my point because I am an uh, urban, urban planner and my, my research in Khartoum and how uh, this urbanization happened in Khartoum. So I go back to see how, the, where come, uh, from where these people come to here and why. So I go to, to, to search about the root causes. Uh, uh, the, the number five, the Margela, these families or these new comers to, to cities marginalized in the cities and they live in uh, very poor neighborhoods without any uh, infrastructure, uh, without even schools or 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 health facilities without jobs and they have to go for long uh, journeys daily to search for informal jobs in in wealthy uh, neighborhoods this situation creates this new uh, pattern of migration most of the children who live in these scams or uh, on uh, poor neighborhoods outside the cities search for new uh, opportunities. They want to improve their life and they lost hope in our countries, even in cities. So they began to migrate to Europe. Maria, I may have to ask you to conclude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have only, uh, yeah two or three, uh, please, uh, number, yeah. This is a destruction of our system. Began with colonialism, introduction of a utilitarian, uh, utilitarian approach to development, and then continue because our uh, addressing the imbalance of power structures. For a long time, we have, in, in most countries, we have, dictatorship or uh, authoritarian regime, even when it is the democracy there. Uh, ending the domination of elites of all kinds and enabling, uh, enabling all segments of society, sustainable peace in our countries. Uh, for us as, uh, as uh, activists, we, we have our intervention and I think uh, we can only put it in points. Uh, first, we, we have to participate in raising our awareness about human rights, women rights, and support of civil society organization at the global level, especially in Europe, with their co counterparts in Horn of Africa. And putting, this is a very important point, putting pressure on European governments to provide support to resolve the root causes of migration, not only to to stop it for for uh, yeah, uh, rather than cooperation with regimes in our countries, because uh, our regimes, as I said, most of them authoritarian regime, they create this problem, so they cannot uh, solve it. We need to support our people and to, yeah, to stop, uh, not to, to try to stop migration without changing the situation in our countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mariam. Thank you for sharing with us the migration patterns within the continent and within Sudan itself as well. We look forward to exploring it even further during the panel discussion. Mm -hmm. Now I'd like to move it uh, now to Rachel, who is joining us from the UK. Hi, Rachel. We look forward to your impulses on the politics of the European Union and the African Union in the Horn of Africa. What message would you like to convey before you start your impulse? Yes, hello. I hope you can hear me well. Um, so, um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for inviting me to participate in this. And I'm really sorry I can't be with you in person. It's actually a privilege to be part of the initiative and to hear the various other speakers. Um, partly because, well, I speak mainly as a, a researcher who's been involved in Civic, you know, researching civic activism and memory and justice questions in Eastern Africa for more than a decade. 
but also because the initiative means a lot to me on a personal level. My father's Ugandan, I was born there. So I kind of share that sense of solidarity with what our first speaker emphasized, the, you know, the common challenges women are facing in this region and the need for collective action. But also perhaps most of all, because I am continually being inspired by the ingenuity of civil society activists I've had the honor to work with, um, in the region, most recently, uh, South Sudanese lawyers and activists um, who I've written a bit about in my book, um, South Sudan's Injustice System. So for me, this initiative is another chance also to learn from women who I really think, you know, are important agents of change in the region. Okay, so I promised to talk about security and justice for the Horn of Africa and to really provide some critical analysis of the uh, EU and AU approaches. So, but let me just say something to put my analysis in context first. Uh, so firstly, for me, regionalism is a progressive force, right? And I, you know, I'm interested in it because I see it um, as such. And some years ago, Alex Duval and I wrote a, a chapter book chapter where we were arguing that the European Union needs in its human security, you know, it needs to develop a human security strategy for the Horn of Africa that should not be just a multilateral approach engaging with regional bodies, but should be the pursuit of multiple and overlapping multilateralisms, which really need to have at the center of it the promotion of regionalized civil society networks. So, you know, I really value this initiative as part of that sort of agenda and I feel there is a need to embrace informal regionalism and connectivities between people across borders which you know the, um, this initiative is also concerned with and of course this is not a new idea and it's not a kind of Eurocentric idea in any sense since the concept of regionalism is you know long predated by you know even the European project is predated by pan-Africanist thinkers and in this regard, I, I just want to highlight a wonderful book by Adam Getachu, where she shows um, anti-colonial nationalists were seeking an egalitarian post-imperial world, which was not, they were not envisaging a simply statist and nationalist, but genuinely uh, regionalized uh, federations to challenge international racial hierarchies. And we haven't seen that in these kinds of visions really emerging, but I think they still matter. Now that said, I want to do two things in this short talk. I want to first make some general points about the regional organizations. And some of these just lean on well-known and well-rehearsed criticisms and echo concerns raised by our previous speakers. And they've made it really very clear that we're at a critical juncture in the Horn of Africa. And I was in a previous meeting earlier today, where, um, which was part of actually um, an initiative, the Research Working Group in the Horn of Africa, which I've been involved in, which is in support of the African Union high level panel to the, um, which is, you know, uh, actually uh, involved in peace mediation in the region. Um, and, you know, as a bunch of researchers, we're trying to make recommendations to this panel. And in this meeting today, we were talking about this critical juncture in the very much the same terms that have been stated by our previous speakers describing it as a, essentially what we're seeing is this kind of interlocking comp, conflict system in the region and an existential crisis both for the people and also for these regional organizations who are failing fundamentally to address it in, in the present moment. So we need to understand how we got there and what can be done. Um, and in terms of the... Uh, the regional organizations, uh, we also need to definitely need to critically evaluate the relations between uh, the EU and uh, the states and the regional organizations, so in the whole of Africa, to understand the current predicament. And the contradictions in their policies, I think, need to be seen as part of the problem. And again, previous speakers have really highlighted this, so I'm simply reinforcing it. But let me briefly indicate some positives as well as some negatives. So in the past 20 years, there's been a huge achievement driving regionalism in the Horn of Africa forward. The EU has been the major donor in terms of supporting the AU and also IGAD. You know, in a meeting earlier today, just listening to the EU representative to IGAD, you know, she was setting out their commitment to peace, democracy, 
um, as priorities and really arguing for the need to enhance women's leadership and decision making in the region, all of which is positive. Also, you know, the EU is promising to deepen its strategic relationship with the region. It's kind of progressive language and solidarity, you know, is absolutely essential to the region in the midst of this global pandemic. So humanitarian support is inadequate. It's not enough, but it's still worth commending in these harsh times where, you know, for instance, the British government is cutting its international aid. Any efforts to support, you know, as the EU recently has done, the African Centre for Disease Control and Prevention or to fund humanitarian aid for people in Tigray and the statement from the EU calling for the respect of, you know, international humanitarian law and, you know, for the end to the tax on civilians and for justice in Tigray. And all of these are to be welcomed. Nevertheless, um, you know, there are many critical points I want to make, and I think you've already made, and I will just mention those in a, in a moment. But let me also say, you know, at the regional level itself, you know, we've seen incredible progress. You know, the African Union emerged in terms of the elaboration of norms and institutions. The African Union emerged really um, from 2002 with, you know, very progressive agendas for democracy, peace and justice. And they've gone a long way in terms of elaborating those as norms, principles and institutions. And civil society and women have been an absolutely crucial part of that process. And you can see this going back to the work of Margaret Bogta, a Nigerian scholar and diplomat who really contributed even way back in the OAU to shaping the OAU mechanism for conflict prevention. And, you know, she was really stressing in those days back in the 90s, you know, the need for civil society groups to be involved, that they are best placed to identify tensions be building within communities before conflicts erupt. Um, and certainly now we have, you know, an African Women's Committee, we have a Women, Gender and Youth director, Directorate, many sort of progressive uh, uh, sort of institutions and norms, and of course the abandonment of the continental organisation of the policy of non-indifference uh, in the aftermath of Rwanda and a lot of critical reflection and progress after that. So, you know, so as some describe it, we have seen this sort of tentative Pax Africana, with a shared appreciation of the value of African norms and practices um, and, you know, human rights agendas emerging. Of course, not all the states supported this and many violated it heavily, but it's still there and it's something to, that needs to be invigorated and pushed forward. Um, but at both at the level of the EU and of the African Union, there are really major, major inconsistencies and the two are really linked. So on the EU side, um, I think others have made strong and important criticisms of the cartoon process. I won't reiterate that, but just simply to say, you know, these are echoed by, you know, for instance, Ruben Anderson, Oxford scholar, who's talked about the way the EU has managed successive migration crises by investing massively, funding an illegality industry, as he calls it. Um, by Lutzetta and Mohamed Babakir at Soas, who have done this kind of critical review of the cartoon process in Sudan, you know, making many of the, the same sorts of points that have been made by our earlier speakers about the problems of the cartoon process in that context. Um, and as Iman, you know, spoke about, you know, migration is obviously not going to be solved through these securitized approaches, since it's a local and a very logical response to poverty, conflict, repression and structural violence and to increasingly to these climate um, emergency as it encroaches with drought and water and food shortages. Um, and to the fact that there isn't really the possibility of integration in the neighbouring states and humanitarian support is inadequate so people rely on social networks. For instance, my colleague uh, Dr. Amira Ahmed has done in her work on um, uh, refugees in Egypt, the very important work to show that they're essentially surviving based on solidarity networks among themselves. There is such limited support for them that, you know, that that is really what is keeping them alive. Um, now, let me just turn back to the AU to, to emphasize that it is also fundamentally failing to deliver in terms of addressing the conflict and human rights violations that would help to, to stem, you know, kind of migration. Rachel, and it is really, on. you know, very troubling that despite the human Can rights Rachel reports and excellent reporting by journalists like Nimel Gabir 
CNN, for instance, revealing their atrocities in Tigray. The AU and the UGAD response has been at least initially extraordinarily weak. And there was a particularly low point in December 2020 when the AU chairperson said Rachel? Ethiopia's military campaign in Tigray province was legitimate for all states. Can we write Rachel um, that she should conclude, please? So, um, I, you know, I want to now turn to my own research and kind of work as part of this research working group dialogue. <laughs> Um, which we held in July 2020 with mostly women all around the region, academics. Uh, there were only 20 women. Uh, we all came together online, but it was a very fruitful discussion. There were academics, journalists, civil society activists. And um, I'll, I'll just, because I don't have a lot more time, I'm just going to flag up that we have, out of this um, initiative, produced a report uh, where we make a number of recommendations to the AU and IGAD on how to involve and drive towards a participatory regionalism and how to invigorate justice initiatives with the support of civil society in the region. And I'm very happy to share the report if anyone is interested, but also we have um, published a number of um, blog pieces by participants in this, by young people, chat. Is there uh, such as Emily Quitty was involved in the uh, South Sudan peace process, by um, experts such as, um, mm -hmm. uh, we had various participants such as um, Fatima Ali, for instance, Somali academic, and they're there on the African Arguments Debating Ideas blog. So I'm happy to share that link as well. I'll draw this to a close, but I think simply to say what we Concluded in that dialogue, and what I think is obvious here. I'm just, I'm just going to uh, finish on this one point, which is to say that, you know, what was obvious in that dialogue and was also clear here is that feminists are invigorating and redefining pan Africanism. And this is really where the hope lies. And the regional actors need to attend much more closely to the feminist critiques and their proposals and um, engage with them. And that's really one of our core recommendations, I think. Um, yeah, I just wanted to stress that as it's very relevant to your work also. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> right, now I don't want to waste any more time. I would like us now to move on to our panel discussion. We'd like to design this discussion as interactive as possible, so please do feel free to bring your hand up and I will keep my distance with the microphone, or perhaps you can just simply speak up. It's very important that you share your insights, you pose any questions or seek any clarifications in regards to this discussion, because our aim at the end of the day is to find uh, any sort of conclusions in what women can do in order to foster change, but also bring peace or perhaps mitigate the conflict in the Horn of Africa. So I'm going to ask one question to all of you ladies. My question, starting with Iman, is whether you can give us a concrete example in how women in and out of the diaspora can broaden the awareness of the current situation in the Horn of Africa and also provide support. Do we have a second microphone by any chance? Um, I think uh, women um, usually have, um, they usually initiate the, the, the processes and the work, but the fruits normally go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Women in diaspora have been always active in networking and speaking about, out about the atrocities, about the issues of, uh, of women and, and political issues and injustices that happen in my country or, any other, or anywhere else. But still, those who are outside um, are less recognized and those who are inside are recognized uh, and marginalized because they are there, they go and meet and so forth, but still they are not allowed or they are not given the chance to do much uh, in a practical way. Mm -hmm. As I have demonstrated that the representation of women have been very low or un unrecognizable. 
in diaspora we have uh, we have the privilege of freedom of speech we can, we can say, we can speak free and express our opinions regardless of uh, there is no drawbacks or um, anything that could happen to us because of what we are saying but it is not the same case of other women or activists inside the country because regardless of the transition or um, the hosting of the regime but still uh, still the process of human rights and freedom of speech is not well set in the country yet and that is why i think the complementarity between the the uh, the roles of uh, of people in the diaspora or women in the diaspora and women inside Sudan. Plus, we have also uh, access to mobility and uh, meetings and uh, resources. We are, at least we can still communicate and we have the, the privilege of time. Women back in my country, they know their issues, but still they are struggling of, fi of sustaining their families, doing the everyday job and still they are not recognized. This is, I think this is unfair. Now, uh, women have never been recognized in any sector. And here I would like only to stress in one, uh, or to highlight one issues, that regardless of um, uh, uh, long efforts that have been exerted in women issues in my country, mm -hmm. but the neglect have been um, have been uh, done for the issues of women in agricultural sector, that their works are not recognized and are not registered within Ministry of Finance or everywhere. Nobody knows how much women are working. Uh, also, for example, my aunt, she worked on the, on the field from morning up to five o'clock, from five to five, from six to five, but no one or nowhere you can find records in the country where what are these women doing or how much is the equivalent or um, getting back the rewards of what they have producing. This is, um, this is the vicious circle that we are in, that we are, we are part of the state, we work and we, we participate in production, but we are not gaining back anything. And still other women... Uh, or women groups in the center, they, they don't have the access to the information about the women in, in, um, uh, in rural areas. And where Sudan is 60% uh, or 80% of Sudan is a rural area, not urban centers. Mm -hmm. But the issues that has been raised are actually the issues of uh, urban or, or women in urbanized uh, centers. And this is uh, brings vicious injustices. And uh, I, I would like also to make remarks on what my colleague Amira uh, Miriam have said. Well, before you go carry on, I, I would like to just simply ask that same question as well to your colleague sitting next to you. If you could um, let me know uh, what, what your thoughts are and how women in the diaspora or outside of the diaspora uh, could also provide support. When you say outside the diaspora, mm -hmm. so uh, people that are not from the diaspora. Are you mean the international yes. community, or yes, correct. Okay. Um, well, I mean, uh, I meant uh, Iman said about um, the um, campaigning. Uh, our job has, uh, as I say, we are in a very comfortable situation. You can use the second microphone next Hello? to Hello? Okay, I think it's okay. Now. So we are um, living in uh, democratic spaces um, in Europe. Uh, we are in a very com uh, comfortable situation to raise our voices on behalf of uh, women uh, and um, also as so members our country, respective countries, that is one of the main issue uh, or main uh, work we do as a network of Eritrean women. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, this is one. Um, and uh, of course, I mean, like m most of us, we have skills, we are professionals, we also analyze and uh, undertake um, 
research um, um, network uh, we bring issues and um, on the ground or we look into what is happening on the ground to uh, bring it to the surface um, this is one uh, important issue that uh, the diaspora can be um, yeah can be useful or can uh, contribute in a useful way mm -hmm. thank yeah. you very much yeah. Asia Maria what are your thoughts? Can you give us concrete examples in how women in the diaspora and outside of the diaspora can provide support? Yeah, I think we can do it. And Israra is one of the examples. Her uh, conference, Arts of Panatmandi, she has a lot of work and a lot of sessions. Most of them, uh, here she 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 live here in in Vienna, but uh, she uh, do a lot of things for women of Sudan or uh, Horn of Africa elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to to benefit from the social media, mm -hmm. and we can contact with our people daily. We can do uh, an event, and most of them they have. Uh, access to to social media mm -hmm. and i think this is our our opportunity to affect the situation inside our country this social media mm -hmm. thank you very much yes. maria rachel are you with us okay we we're going to carry on with the discussion now uh, unfortunately there's a technical issue uh we've got our three ladies here we can also um, facilitate the discussion. So my next, well, actually, let me just conclude what we figured out now. So I have uh, solutions uh, of the informal economy. So we, we, we realize that there's a lot of women, let's say not just women, but our focus is women, a lot of women from the rural areas who are migrating to the, uh, to the urban areas. And because of that, they are struggling because many of them don't, uh, they're, they're trapped in the informal economy because they lack the uh, skills uh, mm. to, to, to work in, in professional jobs. And uh, this is a vicious cycle because in this regard, they have lack of information. And um, because of that, uh, they, 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 they're struggling. Um, however, there's uh, perhaps an opportunity for women in the diaspora to um, get in touch with these women, uh, perhaps through training and education. And um, also, we all need to benefit from the social media in order to pass on information and also social remittances. So under social remittances, I understand transfer of knowledge, which can perhaps also be done through social media. So this is what I understood from your answers to my question. Um, moving on to my next question, uh, I, I would like to throw this in the round as well. Um, rape and sexual violence is affecting women in Africa, particularly during the pandemic, around the world, but also in, in the Horn of Africa. What can be done to counteract this? And I would like to throw this uh, in the round. Yeah, sure. I, I, perhaps I was speaking too fast. Rape and sexual violence, it's an epidemic in itself in the Horn of Africa. Um, what can we do in order to counteract this? Can, can someone give uh, her the microphone? Thanks. Sorry about that, you know. Uh, we have great experience uh, and painful one. Uh, in rape and sexual violence, we have it in Darfur conflict where rape and sexual violence has been used as a tool of war. And as a result, as one of the one of the uh, reports of the um, in the prosecutor of International Criminal Court, that most of the women of Darfur, uh, nearly 60 percent to 7 percent in conflict zone, were raped. And this is a very huge number, yeah. and it has a drawbacks of other sexual diseases and a stigma and some other issues that coming with uh, with sexual violence and um, and rape. Uh, plus, in 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 Khartoum also, I mean in non non conflict zones, 
There is also sexual violence, uh, and it has been also used as tool of torture in detention centers and, um, and police stations. So many, uh, many women have reported such kind of violence. What we can do, I think, um, <clears throat> in my country, until now, there is no one have been punished by a uh, in rape case. It's very difficult to to punish, and it is like in you can count them in fingers. Those who have been convicted and have been received uh, um, justice being done in these cases. That is why the impunity of the perpetrators always um, invites others to do the same. In this, uh, in the community uh, where we don't have um, uh, justice, is not being served within the community, then the crime continues on and on. And that's why one of the measures that we have to do is uh, straightforward laws that criminalize these acts. And second, we need to make for um, a special court for this kind of crimes, because it's now um, endemic crimes in my in my country, at least I say. And I was in Kenya also. There were your country, Sudan, you mean, right? Sudan, yes. Mm -hmm. And then in Kenya also, I remember where I was there. There is like an incident of uh, rape every twenty minutes, which is a huge. Uh, or a rape attempt or sexual violence. This is, um, this is a, a huge atrocities that committed to women. Leave it alone, the, the rape and sexual violence, uh, the domestic ones that have never been reported or coming out because of the stigma and because of the social barriers and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that is why I think one, the laws uh, and having special courts for such crimes more involvement of women in law enforcement organizations, be it police, be it peacekeeping missions, and so forth. Because women, I think, will be more, uh, uh, more, um, uh, more relevant in this case. And I remember in one in Darfur that women have never get the courage to speak to men, the investigators. Uh, they don't, and, and even in police stations where you go, you find a man. I think one of the solutions also the, in the law enforcement uh, or police stations, we, or we need to have um, a, 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 a section or a department for sexual violence department where women can tackle the issues of women. But uh, uh, it's also in these issues of uh, sexual violence, of course, we need to raise awareness and we need to incorporate such kind of human rights uh, issues within the curriculums of the schools and to make children aware of why these things happening and how we can mitigate these kind of things and how to protect the, the child girls from the violence. And we still have like the uh, female genital machination is widely uh, practiced in the Horn of Africa and especially in Sudan. Uh, but still the criminals and per perpetrators of such crimes have never forwarded to justice. That is why impunity is one of the diseases that is there in my country. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you, Azio. So for me, um, there is a long term, uh, um, there should be a long term and a short term involvement with regards to sexual violence uh, and rape and all these kind of um, atrocities towards women, not only in Africa, but everywhere in the world. Um, when sex, sexual, uh, sexual violence happens, it doesn't come from nowhere. It, it happens because we have a society that is very misogynist, society that is, uh, does value women so little, women have no value, and in this situation they are of course very um, valuable. So here um, you have of course then to have an everyday work um, to tackle this. So we have a lot of civil society organization on the ground doing great work, um, doing campaign, um, uh, interacting with the society and bringing changes in the society to 
bring equality in women. As long as we have inequality um, um, and um, um, misogynist and um, uh, patriarchal society, we will have always um, violence against women. And this is not only in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Horn of Africa, also in Austria and Germany. So the long-term um, plan objective should be to fight uh, patriarchy, to fight misogyny, um, uh, attitudes towards women. Um, and the, the short term is, of course, um, as um, Iman said, um, bringing perpetrator into justice, uh, like in Somaliland where I work. Um, since uh, we established um, the so-called um, sexual assault center, before it used to be absolutely everybody was denying it. Sexual violence doesn't exist in our society. There, it brings a lot of shame. People didn't want to and, and, and admit. And then we had a center. And, uh, and then, of course, sexual against women and girls, it was all, all of a sudden visible. So no one could deny it. And even imam, a religious leader, started to talk about this. Uh, these, um, the, the incidents, people were shocked that uh, even girls as, um, as small as six months were raped. So society will start, of course, to acknowledge that these kind of things are happening when they see... Um, there is a center. And as she said, we have, of course, police officers um, investigating it. Um, you have to, there is a lot that you could do. But I guess in the long term, globally, there, we need to change um, the mindset of people. And um, that's why women's participation at the higher level is very important. If, you, if men are deciding um, our country's uh, future, we will always still remain, women will always be a victim, not only of um, uh, violence like this that we are witnessing in, in the region right now, but of any form of violence. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mariam. What's your take on this? I think your microphone works. You probably ah, okay. don't need the ah, help. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will approach this question from another perspective. Yeah, please do. Yeah, uh, as the urban planner, uh, I think the built environment has effect in this in this issue because uh, when uh, if we take Khartoum as an example, in the uh, outskirts of the city there are many violence and uh, against women. Uh, that is why, because they have no lights in streets. Mm -hmm. And most of the women uh, work uh, in the center and uh, they come back too late to their houses. So they are uh, subjected to this type of violence. Also, the type of uh, uh, houses, also housing, mm -hmm. the inadequate housing also has an impact in this, uh, in this issue. When the, the family uh, have no enough uh, space, for living, they have uh, most of them. They have one room, and they have no privacy, have no place to do their uh, their private things. So in this in this environment, the the violence increased. Mm -hmm. So we need to change the built environment for people to to make the situation better for them and to give them more uh, adequate uh, housing. And also, uh, when they have no job also, the people, also the conflict is related to, 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 to their situation, economic situation also. In our countries, uh, or in the uh, poor uh, neighborhoods, uh, most of women uh, work in informal work and they can gain money and uh, they can live and, and support their families. In another side, uh, men, they have little chance to work. Most of them uh, stay at home with, uh, without uh, work. And then when women come back from work, they have conflict and sometimes uh, Violence. I think this is a very important side, and we need to to concentrate in this type of solution, not only uh, legislation. 
uh, uh, this is uh, evident in in the India. They have this type of conflict or this uh, type of violence in streets. Mm -hmm. And at the end, uh, many research find that the problem is not only uh, uh, legislation is not enough. You, we need to to change the situation and to to give them uh, better capabilities to live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, Marion. Please. Do you want to use the microphone? Sorry about that, because our microphone is working. Yours, unfortunately, isn't. Forgive me. I just want to say there is, um, that's why there is also an emphasis in the, in the 1325, the, the three PP, I think then, and then pro, they call them, uh, uh, PP, protection, pro, pro, prosecution, and participation. And so, um, women, uh, have to be protected, as she said, there should be measures, like, um, we know, um, in the, in some of the community that I work, women, um, uh, when they go to fetch, for water or firewood at night, uh, they are raped because, uh, or they experience rape because there is no lighting system. Um, and um, if um, in a long term there is prosecution, there is followed up accountability, of course you will see a re a reduction in cases of rape. Um, yeah, and um, the other third, I don't know, the other, so prosecution, um, uh, protection and uh, participation. And then, of course, if women are represented uh, and um, definitely you will see also more, like in the context where I work, we started to establish Women Lawyer Association, we started to have uh, women judges, uh, we have uh, to start to have women police officers, and then you could see the changes. And I'm not saying, um, I, I was saying before also, I mean, we need to have a long-term and a short-term uh, uh, approach to this. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, because we're almost running out yes, of time. Yeah. Rachel has responded to this question as well, which I would like to read out. But before I do that, I would like to ask, does anyone have any questions on what has been discussed so far? Yeah? Um, can someone come with the microphone to the lady? Um, with a nice shirt, a black shirt with flowers on it, or is it a bird? I can't see it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for this really interesting insight. And uh, as we know, Uh, maybe it's the microphone not working. Yeah, yeah. I don't think the microphone's working. There's a microphone just behind you. Yeah, that's one. That one's better. Let them hold it for you, just for for so, security reasons. Again, yep. Very. And inclusive peace is uh, very essential for the um, sustainability of the peace process. I wanted to ask you of your perceptions and also in your networks, what do you perceive as what are the main obstacles um, women encountered to be put on the table or be included in the peace processes? I mean, we already... You said already um, lack of information or freedom of speech, but uh, yeah. Okay, so I'll take your question. I'll take one more question, but unfortunately, we literally have five minutes. So please keep your answer brief. We still have a networking opportunity after this panel discussion, but because we also have people across the world joining from Facebook, we'll probably have to end it at nine o'clock, just in case you're wondering why I'm being so strict. So if I could take a second question. Yours is going to be answered. Just bear with us. Yeah, my, yeah, my thank you very much. Uh, my question was uh, to Rachel, and also the other question will be to the panel here. Uh, why the regional body, regional bodies in the Horn of Africa, like IGAD, is failing to mitigate conflicts? Um, is it due to inability for these bodies to actually mitigate this conflict in the Horn of Africa or the influence of certain members of these bodies who wield a lot of power or a lot of influence 
and do not allow these conflicts to be mitigated. And the other question was, um, the panel have spoken about the authoritarian uh, governments that uh, we have in the Horn of Africa and the movement to try to move into democratization. So what will be the role of women uh, moving into democratization? What should uh, happen that we can support? Because we saw uh, recently there was an uh, election in Somaliland where Asia Wax and no woman was voted, although it, it was peaceful and it was uh, well done in a way. A lot of observers say it was democratically uh, well, but there were no women who were voted in. I'm not removing myself off, myself out of the whole uh, issue, but I'm saying like what could be uh, could be done in this uh, part that we should support. Wonderful questions. You opened up a can of worms because this means we will sit here for a while again. So you have to pick one question. Which question can they answer? One of them. Okay, it's up to you. So. Um, the questions, have you guys remember the questions? The first question of the lady that was posed is what constraints have you um, come across by bringing women together? To be included in the peace process. Exactly. If you could, uh, that's the first question. Uh, yes, I think uh, the only obstacle is that uh, men, they think political arena is only for men. Because in our struggle, for example, in Darfur, women have participated in the armed conflict as soldiers and were in the front line of conflict. Second, they have participated, they have donated money, and in kind, they have donated some crops and, and, and goats and whatsoever, so as to be part and parcel of the struggle. But when it comes to peace talks, Normally, uh, the political leaders, they think polit politics is not an arena for women. And this is the domination here. These peace talks are dominated by men. And again, the question, I can reverse the question. These peace talks is always have mediators and have uh, facilitators, and those people who donated funds. And the funds normally come from Western countries where human rights and women participation are well respected. But why they don't even mention uh, why you are not bringing women to this table and why, or we, we will not pay to this, uh, we will not pay our share unless we see some women or we collect women resumes and bring them to peace uh, talks. I have an experience during the peace talks of, uh, 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 in South Sudan I have lobbied with, uh, with Senator Sabina ja Mobina Jaffer. She was a, a Canadian senator. I, I was belonging to North, but I lobbied with her so that we can forward names to peace talks. Again, during Darfur conflict, peace talks in Abuja, I was not represented, but I have also lobbied to get support and actually they have sent uh, women, they provided the uh, air tickets and so forth, but actually those women, they have never got the, the needed sub technical support so that they can sit on the table and negotiate together with men. But at least we have done some part of it and I, I hope that and even in, uh, in, in Juba, um, peace talks, there is uh, the, the participation of women were so little. It's not, it is beyond our expectation or ambitions to have women on the peace process. But it is mainly because there is neglect and uh, neglect from the donors and, and mediators. And again, those who are on the political figures in Sudan, they think that politics is the arena for, uh, for men and not for women. And, and it is also coming from our culture that when it comes to, to peace talks or important issues, now women uh, is to sit back and do something else. While the product, the peace, pro the peace products or conclusion of peace agreement can only be served or, uh, or, uh, or workable by these women who are in the, in, the, in the localities or in IDP's camps, because they are the majority. And unfortunately, they are not represented. 
Thank you very much, Iman. Now, um, I don't want Rachel to miss out on sharing her perspective as well. Um, she had an answer, uh, an answer um, written about rape and sexual violence. So I'm going to read it out in her words. On the issue of rape and sexual violence, I would like to agree with all that has been said and also emphasize the continuum of violence against women in the patriarchal society in the Horn of Africa and beyond. All the points raised on Sudan are also relevant in South Sudan and elsewhere, but special courts and women lawyers are already making changes, even if this very difficult conflict is setting. In South Sudan, what happens in customary courts matters, as well as statutory courts. I have worked with young male paralegals and they have made efforts together with women's rights activists to engage with chiefs to challenge bride wealth norms in which women are being treated as property. I think these on the ground efforts, even if small, are also important in driving forward normative changes and must be supported. And on this note, I would like to end this wonderful discussion that we've had now. Unfortunately, we've come into the panel discussion. We still have some time for us to network and have our perspective shared then. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for tuning in from Facebook. Have a lovely evening. My name is Ritsay Stever. Auf Wiedersehen. Thank you.